QuickBooks Online 2023. Enter normal sales cycle, which includes inventory into QuickBooks Online for comparison to an e-commerce type situation. Get ready to earn the skills needed to boost your bank books on up with QuickBooks Online 2023. Support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course. Each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it. Here we are in our QuickBooks Online test company file using the accountant view as opposed to the business view. You can toggle between the two views by going to the cog up top, switch the view down below duplicating some tabs to put reports in like we're going to do every time right click in the tab up top to duplicate it i'm going to right click the tab up top to duplicate it again i'm going to do it one more time so we can open up our inventory report as well right click in the tab up top and duplicating going back to the middle tab which was duplicated reports on the left hand side let's open up the balance sheet reports as it's thinking tab into the right reports on the left this time the profit and loss the p l the income statement tabbing to the right reports on the left this time i'm going to type in inventory because i want an inventory report inventory let's do the inventory valuation summary and then let's go back to this balance sheet tab and do our date ranges i'm going to close the hand boogie and let's do 120125 to 123125 and I will run that one and then tab into the right closing the hand buggy range to the change from 010 not 01 120125 to 123125 and run that one uh, nothing's in it thus far tabbing to the right one more time closing the hand boogie and let's put this up to 123125 and run it so in a prior presentation we talked about we've been following the flow of the inventory cycle in a normal kind of on ground type of situation managing the inventory with quickbooks using a perpetual inventory system so we can then compare the differences of that situation to an e-commerce type of situation the last time we talked about the vendor side of the purchasing cycle we bought the inventory in other words and you could do so with a purchase order and then a bill and then the paying of the bill or you might just have an electronic transfer that's going to hit the bank feeds for the purchase of the inventory when we purchase the inventory traditionally we want to be putting it on the books as an asset because we haven't yet consumed it in order to generate revenue and then when we sell the inventory if we have a perpetual inventory system we're going to be decreasing the inventory at the same point in time that we record the sales you can imagine if it was an on ground situation that happening at like a cash register or you can imagine an invoicing situation but let's imagine like a cash register because that's similar to an e-commerce type of situation so at this point in time now for following the inventory we've got the inventory on the books on the balance sheet in the account of inventory it's recorded at the cost of the inventory and then we have the inventory over here in our inventory valuation summary broken out by item of inventory units of items of inventory as well as the total cost value of the inventory which matches what's on the balance sheet to do that if i tab to the left we had to add the inventory items so if i go back down to the sales and to the right to the products and services we added our inventory items in here in order to populate the the bill and the purchase order and uh the payment so now we're going to make a sale so let's imagine we're at the cash register on our store and we're going to someone comes up with products that they want to be purchasing right so we're going to say all right 
not an invoice because we're at the store. So it's going to be a sales receipt <clears throat> type of transaction. So we'll enter the sales receipt starting out with the customer. I'm picking generic customer number one as we do. Note that some businesses, it's quite important to get a lot of information about the customer to facilitate whatever work that you've been contracted to do. And in other businesses, it's not quite so important. When we're looking at something analogous to a Shopify store, which is usually geared towards selling high volumes of products and inventory, then we usually aren't looking to get a whole lot of information about any particular customer other than the email address to try to get them on our email marketing list or something like that. So when we go into the Shopify, as opposed to imagining an on ground situation selling at a cash register, that information is probably going to be given to us through the Shopify platform. And then we have the question of when we pull it into QuickBooks, do we need to repeat that information over here in QuickBooks? That's one of the issues that will come up when we do this through like a Shopify store instead of actually uh, within the QuickBooks. So let's tap through this. I'm gonna say the date of this is gonna be 12, let's say 1525 and payment method. I'll just leave it blank. We're gonna go down to the items that have been sold. Let's say that we sold product product or produce too. Let's do some produce too. Let's sell five of those at 200. Notice that this is pulling in automatically for us because we entered the items. And so let's sell another one at the same time. They also are coming up to the cash register with their produce as well as product number one. And let's say we sold seven of those. So they got seven product number one and five produce in their hand. And that is geared for a uh, 1000. Okay, so let's keep it there. What's this going to do when we record it? This is analogous to if you were in an actual store and actually doing a self checkout, you could just scan your items and say, Yeah, I got five produce two and seven product uh, ones. And the total then is going to be 1700. Note that we're not dealing with sales tax, we might turn on sales tax to add that level of complication into the factor. But without sales tax, it's still a fairly complex transaction. When I actually record it, even though the data input is fairly easy and straightforward, that transaction being because it's a sales receipt, it's going to be uh, increasing either the checking account or you might put it into a, a clearing account, which is often the case. QuickBooks Online calls it payments to deposit. Let's do that so we can kind of see why that is an issue because that will be an issue with the Shopify situation as well. So it's gonna be increasing in essence a, a cash account, but not the checking account yet. The payments to deposit, which is similar to, to uh, <clears throat> undeposited funds in QuickBooks desktop, that's what it used to be called. And then the other side is gonna to go to revenue for the full amount 1,700 and because we have a perpetual inventory system, inventory is gonna go down by uh, the cost of these items, which isn't actually on the sales receipt, but the system knows about it because we put the products in place and the related cost of goods sold, the expense uh, related to us selling the inventory is gonna go up. So the net impact on net income will be the increase of 1,700 minus the cost of goods sold on the income statement and we're going to have our sub uh, ledger, our inventory tracked not only by dollar amount, but also by units. So all that's taking place here. So let's check it out. I'll save and close, save and close it. And then if I go to my balance sheet and run it, now we've put this amount in payments to deposit. There it is here. And the others, and then the other side is going to the revenue account. So if I go to revenue, I could run revenue. So there's the, the 1,700 in the revenue account. And if I go back to the tab to the left, inventory is gonna go down. So here's our inventory account. If I go into it, then it's going down. And it went down by these two amounts, two line items, because they put it in their buy line item, even though it's the same sales receipt. And if I, if I go into it, there's no 750, for example, on this form because it, that's the cost. It's going down by the cost, not the sales price. So we don't actually see that. You don't see the cost of the things when you check something out at the grocery store, for example. So I'm going to close that back out and scroll back. 
and exit this and then I'm gonna go to the tab to the right and cost of goods sold is right there so there's the cost of goods sold and so notice it expensed our inventory at the point in time that we sold it it expensed the inventory so the impact on the income statement is sales minus the cost of goods sold is net income note that this cost of goods sold is being recorded on an accrual basis because no cat we didn't actually pay for the inventory at this point in time when we paid for the inventory in a full service uh, perpetual inventory system we put the inventory on the books as an asset and then we expense it when we consume the asset to generate revenue that's the issue with inventory because that becomes difficult because if we're trying to automate everything we're trying to we're trying to do everything from a cash based system for the most part because that's the easiest thing to draw in to feed into our system so we're going to have to deal with this perpetual inventory system possibly in a little bit different way when we go to our shopify store all right if i go to the tab to the left my voice is going don't go voice i need <clears throat> i need some coffee hold on okay so any case so there's the 9900 in inventory assets if i go to my report over here then and run this now it's tracking my units of products that i have left and it's given me the dollar amount of of those units we need to be tracking both the, of those things obviously knowing the quantity of units is quite important to logistically be able to fulfill any orders that might come in in the future but we also need to know the dollar amount which usually is going to need some kind of flow assumption fifo lifo when we're using a normal kind of inventory system uh, like this with with products which we assume to be all similar in nature uh, in order to to do our financial statements and we're going to need those possibly for taxes now if i compare that to shopify if i look at, at this whole process and say well what what happens if i'm actually facilitating the sale on the shopify or e or some other you know platform uh, amazon or whatever we're doing then obviously this platform is the platform that's going to have the website that facilitates the sale so instead of someone coming up to us with products in at a cash register they're going on to the point of our online presence with their goods that they virtually put into their their uh shopping cart right and then they're gonna and then they're gonna check it out uh, on the shopping cart so that means that the transactions that are taking place in an e-commerce situation are being facilitated by of course the third party platform uh in some way shape or form and that's going to have to track the inventory to some degree so we're, we're probably going to be putting our inventory units but remember that's going to help us so whenever i sell inventory on a on a shopify platform for example it would likely reduce the units of inventory for us which is great for logistical purposes to make sure that we have an appropriate amount of inventory to meet the sales that we expect to happen in the future but from our financial side the then the, the, the question is well now i've got to pull this into the financial statements and there's an added complexity with that inventory versus cost of goods sold and converting units to dollar amount problem when we go to the finance side so that's one thing that we're going to have to deal with now how could we possibly deal with that well i could say every sales transaction that happens on the shopify level let's try to mirror that as if it happened in a point of sale system and try to pull each transaction into quickbooks entering it into quickbooks as a sales receipt and then try to try to track the inventory from shopify into quickbooks most times people don't recommend that especially for smaller businesses oftentimes or mid-sized businesses before a few different reasons one is that it's it's time consuming because then you've got you've got to enter the products over here if you're trying to pull in the inventory information with it and the products uh, have to line up perfectly so you pull in the information it could line up to a product uh, the other reason is it's a bit redundant because you already have the sale information took place over here so if you pull all that information into quickbooks it might not you, you might overload quickbooks because again the shopify store is usually geared towards 
quantity. You want to have a lot of sales. Uh, and if you pull in a whole bunch of sales of small items, like $5 items, and you have a million sales, it's going to start to slow down over time uh, your QuickBooks system. So so generally, the idea is that we don't, we don't want to pull over the whole information oftentimes, but rather try to try to sum up the information that we're going to be pulling in from uh, Shopify into QuickBooks. And that's why we're going to break it down from instead of a perpetual inventory system, more likely to a periodic inventory system so that we can pull in that information possibly uh, more efficiently. Also on the sale side, the sale side already happened over here and there's also going to be costs related to the to a Shopify situation that are going to be charged for the service of Shopify and and they and they might handle other stuff like refunds and stuff like that and possibly uh, you can have to handle taxes in some way. So that stuff on the income side we're going to have to deal with when we pull that information into uh into our QuickBooks system not only the stuff in other words that would happen when we facilitate a sale if it was an on ground situation but the added fees that we have to deal with for the services being provided by the online platforms and possibly the payment processors all right so the other thing that we have to deal with is possibly sales tax and sales tax is a whole nother uh kind of topic that gets gets into the weeds in a shopify thing but for now let's just think about how sales tax generally works so i'm just going to turn on a generic sales tax down here so we're going to go to our taxes down below and we're going to say sales tax and i'm going to use automatic sales tax now this is great if you're having on some it's going to be picking my location here i'm just going to turn this on fairly quickly just to get an idea of it uh tell us more about you so do you need to collect sales tax outside of california if it was an on ground store i'm going to say no which obviously simplifies situations when you're in an in an e-commerce situation then you got a that's a question do i <laughs> am i subject to sales tax in what states and how who's going to be collecting the sales tax and whatnot but let's just see how the process works here i'm not going to create an invoice and this is the sales tax that's going to be that's going to be populated based on my location that i put into the system i'm going to say frequency let's say we pay it monthly okay so that's that's just to turn on the sales tax we might talk more about sales tax in a future presentation right now i just want to see how that fits into a normal sales transaction if you had it running within an on-ground system so if i go into the plus button again and let's make another sales receipt but this time we've got the sales tax running Let's say this is going to go for customer number two, generic customer number two, and the date 1216, let's say. And down here, we're going to say that uh, the item, let's say we had item product number three, and let's say we sold three of those, and it's subject to sales tax. I'm going to check it off that it's subject to sales tax. I should go into the items and say that it's subject to sales tax, but product number one let's say two that are subject and it's subject to sales tax so now the system is calculating sales tax on it so what does that do to our sales receipt transaction well it's a sales receipt so it's still going to be increasing the payment to deposit uh, the clearing account for the full amount the 1204.50 it's going to increase revenue driven by the items for the amount that we charged only 1100 not including the sales tax the difference the sales tax is going to go onto the balance sheet account of sales tax payable which will then pay at a future point in time and then of course the inventory is still going down not by the amounts on the sales receipt but driven by the items which knows that amount and the related cost of goods sold the expense is going up uh, so the new thing then is the sales tax now the thing with the sales tax is you can imagine the sales tax people get confused on how the sales tax is supposed to work because they they start to pay sales tax and they say well why don't i have a sales tax expense account on my income statement and the really the the, the the reason is that in theory the sales tax is being imposed on the customer not on you the business therefore 
you shouldn't include sales tax in revenue. In other words, you can imagine a situation where you say, hey, look, I'm just going to record cash of 1000 uh, 24450 and revenue of 1,24450. $1, and then when I pay the sales tax, I'll have an expense of $104.50 revenue minus expenses will, will meet in net income in the same situation uh, of the 1,100 in the same case, it, it would be just like it would, would be the same bottom line. Why wouldn't I do that? In other words, and the, the rationale is that that isn't, isn't revenue, the 10450, although you're collecting it, you're just the tax collector. It's actually not revenue and therefore shouldn't be on the income statement. We're gonna put it on the balance sheet as a payable. And then you, when you pay it, you're not gonna have an expense. You're just gonna decrease the payable. That's how they want to have it set up. Now, of course, that gets a little bit more complicated when the sales tax stuff is being taken care of by the, another by the Shopify store. So this is another wrinkle in our system here. So let's say, let's save it and close it and see, I'll show you what I'm talking about. And let's go to the balance sheet, <clears throat> run it. And we can see that now in this payments to deposit account, we have multiple items in here for, we're gonna just imagine their cash or whatever, or a credit card, for example, that we're, we're, that we're charged on it, that we need to put into the checking account at some point. The other side's going to revenue. If I go into revenue, let's run this revenue. And so now we've got this second uh, sales invoice that happened and the revenue accounts are here, but it's not including the sales tax in revenue. The difference between those two, if I go back on over, is back on the balance sheet. Let's run the balance sheet. Did I run the balance sheet before? It's back on the balance sheet and uh, it's under the payable account, payable account. Here it is. I was looking for sales tax payable, but they put it under, under the name of the department that you need to pay. Possibly that makes it easier when you have multiple sales tax, but there it is. It's on the, it's on the books as a liability because when you pay the sales pack tax, you're not going to have an expense. You're going to decrease the liability. And then of course, inventory, that's the new thing. Inventory went down. Uh, just like before with the transaction. So inventory is decreasing and the related cost of goods sold is on the P to the L. Cost of goods sold went up. The impact on the income statement is the income not including sales tax minus the cost of goods sold. And if I go back to the balance sheet, our inventory 9120 matches our subledger over here. 9120 tracking the quantity and the uh the total asset value that's over here on the balance sheet okay so there's that added wrinkle with the sales tax now obviously if you're in like a shopify situation or an amazon kind of situation the question is are you subject to sales tax and then which state are you subject to sales tax if you have like an amazon for example then the platform itself might uh, be responsible for a lot of the sales tax we might dive into that more later but that could make things easy but some states might not have that be the case and then the question is where you know are you subject to sales tax uh in the, in the place of your physical location but now you have an online location so does that mean you're subject to sales tax in in different <laughs> states because sales tax is different per state so that gets messy but just the logistics of collecting the sales tax right now is what we want to think about because obviously the sales tax needs to be collected at the point in time that the sale happens, which now isn't going through QuickBooks, but rather is happening on the Shopify or Amazon uh, type of level. So, so when dealing with sales tax, we have to take that into consideration when we're drawing the information in from an Amazon or Shopify type of platform into uh, our QuickBooks system and make sure that we're still managing properly the sales tax. Now, one way you can do that is to try to say, well, I'm gonna try to pull in every transaction and create a sales receipt for every transaction, turn on sales tax within QuickBooks and let QuickBooks calculate it and so on. But again, that becomes kind of redundant. It becomes kind of tedious because, and, and it could weigh down your system because all that stuff has already been done to, on the Shopify to some level 
And so do we really need to pull it all in again? That might be too much, too overwhelming of a job to do. So in other words, we're probably not gonna use the whole sales tax widget thing down here to process our sales tax possibly, but rather hopefully use the other platform to help us to manage the sales side of the of the of the sales tax and then summarize that information in some way into our our quickbooks system in a more simplified method than trying to just pull in you know every every transaction now the other issue the last piece that we're going to talk about right now is the fact that now i've got this amount in payments to deposit so if i think about this from a flow chart we made sales receipts. We didn't deposit them directly into the checking account. You can imagine like a situation where you have cash, but the same thing happens with credit cards and other payment processors. That being, if you have multiple sales that happen during the day and you're at a cash register, then you don't want to put them directly into the checking account each time you make a sale. Uh, because if you made five, you know, 10, $5 sales, then you would have a bunch of $5 amounts in your checking account. But when you deposit the money into the bank, you're gonna to walk to the bank with a full lump sum deposit and put that into the bank. Therefore, it's gonna show up on your bank statement as one number, not you know, 10 $5 amounts. So, so what you wanna do is make sure that you group the deposits into your checking account in the same fashion as they will be represented on your bank statement so you can reconcile. When we pull the information in from a Shopify, we have a similar situation. If I try to pull every transaction in one at a time, make a sales receipt of each one of them, and I deposit it directly into the checking account, I'm gonna still end up with the same problem as we would in an on-ground store, meaning I'm gonna have a bunch of deposits into the checking account, I'll have to kind of add them all up to to lump them together as the same grouping that the payment processors or credit card companies or whatever lump them in our bank account as. They didn't do it $5 at a time. They lumped them together in some way. So, so the way we do that in a non-ground system is we deposit into the payments to deposit generally. And then when I go to the bank at the end of the day, we will make the deposit. So I'll make a bank deposit and then I'm going to deposit these two items at 12.16. Okay, so the full deposit is going to be 2,904.50 instead of two individual deposits, 1,700, 1,204.50, and that then will make it easier to reconcile because my bank statement will have one number, 2,904.50, not two numbers on it. Reconciling is very important and. This is gonna be very important with, with the Shopify kind of, or, or pulling the information from a Shopify type of situation as well, because it's likely that we also wanna automate our bank feeds. And the information that's gonna come in through the bank feeds is gonna be whatever was deposited into the bank, in this case to 2,904.50, not 1,700 or 1,204.50. So that, that becomes an issue we need to be aware of when we pull this information in from like an e-commerce website. So let's save it and close it and see what happens. So we'll say, if I go to my checking, let's run it. So now in my checking account, we pulled the deposit in to uh, the checking account. That would match what hits the checking account with the bank feeds and, and it'll, ha it'll reconcile to the bank reconciliation and the payment account went back down and it shows the payment to deposit, it shows the increases and decreases line item by line item, which is quite nice. So to summarize this, when we, when we compare this to what's gonna happen in a Shopify type of situation or, or some other kind of e-commerce store, note that QuickBooks isn't, isn't, their inventory, perpetual inventory system isn't generally designed to pull the information in from a Shopify type of store, right? Because if I pulled it in, you would think that I would have to make a, a sales receipt in order to properly allocate for the inventory, calculate the sales tax, the way QuickBooks would want to do it in an on, online kind of situation and deal with the payments to properly flow uh, through and match up to what's on uh, the bank feeds. So, 
so we can't normally do a full service you would think you don't typically want to do that because for the reasons we talked about before so we're gonna have to break this up a little bit and quickbooks does work quite well to break it up it's just that when people first think about it about quickbooks they feel like they're just going to turn on all the stuff and pull in the data turn on the inventory and track all the inventory in the same way as you would if it was an on-ground store and that's you'd have to use quickbooks normally a little bit different way and that would be we're going to break this up generally from a perpetual inventory system to a periodic inventory system and we'll pull in the data that we need from Shopify utilizing the import tools, which are going to be bank feeds, possibly some uh, some integration uh, apps uh, to pull in that information. And we'll pull in the information only that we that we need so that we don't overwhelm our QuickBooks system as well. Uh, and we don't make it too tedious on us. Uh, and I, this is similar to the bank feeds. If you if you just turn on the bank feeds, for example, and you have no idea how to use bank feeds, you're just going to pull in a bunch of information and be completely overwhelmed. You have a similar thing with the with a Shopify or an online store. If you just pull in all the transactions from a Shopify and you don't know how to integrate those transactions, you could end up with a with a very big mess, right? So the so what we want to do is summarize the information uh, uh, into QuickBooks. So hopefully, I haven't scared anyone completely away with this but i just want to go over the 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 issues that we'll, we'll we'll go into and then we'll try to simplify that information as we pull it in uh from like an e-commerce source